Hello, everyone, and welcome to this live event for the 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism. We are glad that you're here. My name is Adele Halliday, and I work at the National Office of the United Church of Canada as the Anti-Racism and Equity Lead Staff, and I am among the many who worked collabor collaboratively to bring together this 40-day program. I would note as we begin that this event is offering simultaneous interpretation between English and French, and my colleague Eric will explain a little bit about that. Hello and good evening. I just uh, to let you know, for those of you who may have not used uh, the simultaneous translation feature in Zoom before, if you run your finger across your screen, uh, you'll find uh, a little globe that offers you the interpretation symbol. If you click on that uh, and choose the language that you wish to hear at all times, you will never have to do another thing throughout the meeting. Um, when French is spoken, you'll hear it in English, if you've chosen English, uh, and vice versa if you've chosen French. If you understand both languages, you don't need to use the interpretation module at all, but, uh, but know that you can do that right off the bat. Alors, bonsoir et bienvenue à tout le monde. Um, on vous encourage d'utiliser autant que possible vos, um, uh, votre, votre fonction d'interprétation. Uh, les traducteurs uh, sont présents uh, et seront capables de faire la traduction vers l'anglais. Si vous avez choisi l'anglais uh, ou le français dans le globe, c'est ça que vous allez entendre tout au long, de, de, de sens naturel ou autre. Alors, uh, c'est comme ça que ça peut... Um, uh, um, just to uh, uh, let um, uh, Stephen know, uh, it appears the translators are blocked and uh, that the translation doesn't seem to be working quite yet. So maybe okay. we can leave it with you to deal with the, with the technicalities. Let me, let me that. look into that. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Eric. Merci beaucoup. Uh, so tonight we're here for this very first 40 days live event featuring Desmond Cole. Uh, but just a few details before we hear from Desmond himself. The first thing is to introduce the 40 days of engagement on anti-racism. And this is a 40 day program designed by us in the United Church to create opportunities for people across the church to delve deeply into exploration about anti-racism. And each day during the 40 days, with the exception of Sundays, will feature written content with opportunities for learning, faith reflection, and action. There are 40 day, 40 day live events. This is the first. They will be running on Tuesdays uh, for the next seven weeks, either at 12 o'clock noon Eastern or 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern. We hope you'll join uh, some of the future events as well. Um, there's a newsletter as well where you can keep up to uh, up to date with all of the English language content related to the 40 day program. And Elik will talk just a little bit more about the French language resources related to this as well. Alors, uh, par rapport à ce qui se passe uh, cette année pour... Uh, as far as what's happening this year for the 40 Days Against Racism, the church is organizing an activity of this sort in English and in French. And at the end of the 40 days, we're going to have an assembly to talk about music and to sing together in English and French, and it's going to be a lot of fun. The other thing is that, that there are a number of resources uh, based on 40 Days Against Racism that were already used last year and several that are going to come out today that you will find on the website of the United Church. I'm going to put a link in the chat so that you can access resources uh, on racism that we have compiled on the uh, Francophone side. And there are some resources that were translated from last year, as well as the resources we're making available for this year. Wonderful. Oh, merci. <laughs> Wonderful. So we're about to hear from our featured speaker. Um, and Desmond is going to talk for a little while, but is really hoping this might be a conversation. So even though everyone's microphones are muted, please feel free to use the chat to make comments or note observations, ask questions, or anything else you think would be helpful to share. So uh, please allow me to introduce Desmond. Uh, Desmond Cole is a journalist, activist, and author. He has spent the last 10 years reporting and commenting on politics and social justice. He 
He is especially interested in the struggle for Black liberation in Canada. And Desmond's work includes 10 years of local and national news coverage, five years of radio broadcasting at News Talk 1010, a disruptive opinion column with the Toronto Star, and an award-winning magazine feature. He is the author of the number one national bestseller, The Skin Worn In, A Year of Black Resistance and Power. And I would also note that this book is also available from the United Church Bookstore at a discounted rate. So you're welcome to order the book as well. So we're delighted that Desmond is here. Um, welcome, Desmond, over to you. Thanks, Adele. Um, thank you so much, first of all, Adele, for reaching out to me, asking me to be a part of this evening. Um, thank you to the United Church. It's a pleasure to be with all of you. Um, there are a great many things that I want to discuss this evening, but I'm hoping uh, that I can do that with all of you. Um, so we have a chat function and I have it open so that during the course of this conversation, I can see what people are saying. And in fact, I'm gonna be asking you to participate uh, during this conversation because I think that the sound of me talking is like extremely exciting for me, but it might get boring for you guys after a while, just hearing me talk at you for an extremely long time. So I don't wanna do that. I wanna engage in conversation. I want to interact with people, what people are saying. I want to take questions, as they say, but I don't simply want to take questions. I want to hear people's commentary. I want to hear people's feedback. I want to hear people's challenges. If there are challenges that people have to things that I'm saying that maybe don't necessarily sit well, or you have a different opinion. Um, I am not afraid to engage a lot of the difficulties that we are hoping to address together here. The obvious thing is that, oh, I'm sure everybody here knows that we won't be dealing with anything that's discriminatory or harmful or abusive in any way this evening. And uh, beyond that, I want us to be able to have a really open conversation. So I'm inviting all of you to participate as much as you feel able to do that. And um, um, before I kind of really open it up for everybody, although, as I said, I'll be watching the chat, I'll be um, paying attention to what people are saying as I'm going through. I have a few notes of things that I, I wanted to touch on as a starting point. And actually, as a starting point, I said I wanted participation. So I'm going to ask all of you a question right now. And I see that there's quite a lot of us here, about 130 people here, more rolling in. Um, I want to ask all of you about risk-taking, because I think that that's very central to what I wanted to come and talk about this evening. But I want it to be meaningful for all of you, and I want us to collectively reflect on what we think of when we think about taking risks. So um, I would like all of you to think about your own lives right now. And to tell me in the chat, um, and you don't have to go into great detail or too personal detail of any sort, not for anything we're going to talk about this evening. But generally speaking, if you think about your life, who are you willing to take risks for? What are you willing to take risks for? And if you want also, why? Are you willing to take the risks in life that you are willing to take? So this could be things that you do already take risks for in your life. This could be a hypothetical, like if ever there was a situation where such and such and such, I would be willing to risk my time, risk my energy, maybe even risk my safety, my comfort. What? resonates for all of you when I ask that. In your own lives, what are you willing to take a risk for, make a sacrifice for? Who in your life are you willing to make a sacrifice for? What principles or values are you willing to say, you know, if it comes to this or that, I would be willing to put myself on the line? Um, 
And so now I'm starting to see some of the answers. And I, I thought about this a little bit before, but I asked you and I, and I had a guess about what most people would say, because I imagine what I would say. And I thought most people probably have a range of immediate things that come to our minds and I'm seeing them already. And the number one thing I'm seeing here is our families. So my son, because I love him, my immediate family, um, clients and people that I work with. Um, somebody says I would risk around speaking out to opponents about homelessness, take risks for my family. I would take mo risks for most people if they are not hurting others. Um, when I hear God calling me, I'm willing to risk my safety and comfort for just about anything. That is a really interesting answer. Um, and that's why I said it as a hypothetical as well, right? Because sometimes the thing that we might be willing to take a risk for is not like necessarily present or happening in this moment right in front of us or in our lives. But we know that if we were ever called by our religion, by our faith, if we were ever called by our politics, if we were ever called by our conscience, um, that we would be willing to take those risks. I, I see a lot more answers here about family those I love and those who are most vulnerable in the world. Um, my family, my family. I see somebody in the chat saying, I, 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 this must, must be a very personal one, but Palestine, Kashmir, anti-imperialism. My family, peacekeeping, reconciliation. I'm willing to risk my time and energy for those who are ignored because I can't believe the way people treat others these days. Um, thank you for this. I see another for the voiceless. When I see unfairness, um, people with mental illness. These are many of the ideas that I imagine that people would share. And I'm sure that there are many others that we could brainstorm together. Um, somebody says offering leadership often feels risky and uh, we're definitely going to be talking about that in terms of risk taking um tonight thank you everybody for these answers um one really big core belief that i have is that taking risks is the key to our collective liberation um i write about and fight for black liberation um I consider the struggle that I am in in this world to be many things, but one of the big things, one of the big things that it is, it is a struggle for my liberation as a Black person and for the liberation of all Black people, no matter where they live in the world, no matter their gender, no matter their sexual orientation, no matter their politics, no matter uh, their you know, geography. Um, I also believe that I'm in a class struggle and that's another really big way that I identify what liberation means for me is that I, I definitely believe in the phrase, no war, but class war. And, uh, I say that with the knowledge that, um, those of us who are on the bottom didn't start the class war. So war is a bad word and it should be. But um, if someone is waging war against you, you have to defend yourself. You have to defend yourself. And so there is a class war happening, but uh, those of us who are on the bottom didn't start the war. But we have to engage in it because this is our life. This is the world that we have inherited. So I very much see my uh, liberation and the collective liberation of all people as also being a class struggle as well as a race struggle. Um, but I think that that struggle is impossible unless we're willing to take risks. And I particularly think that the risks that are necessary have to be the kind of risks that are not only in service of those closest to us. Because I resonate with everybody here who says, well, I would take a risk for my family, so would I. I would take a risk for my children. I would take a risk for my mom and dad. I would take a risk for my close circle of relatives and my family. 
Other people talked about people that they worked with. I would take a risk for people that I work with. I would take a risk for people who are vulnerable, are marginalized, who are oppressed, who don't have housing, who have mental health challenges. For me, we have to actually use risk-taking as the metric by which we define liberatory, emancipatory work. And that is because um, many of us, myself included, have the great privilege of being able to spend a lot of time thinking about the struggle that we're all in collectively right now. Uh, a great many people who are suffering the most in this world do not have time to do what we are doing right now. They just don't have time. They don't have the comfort. They don't have the resources. They don't have the peace of mind. They don't have a computer. So we can have this conversation and that's a great benefit for all of us, but that's not the work. I wrote a book, it's here. Um, some of you have read it. You can read my book. And that's a really wonderful way, one of thousands, of trying to understand the Black liberation struggle in this country, in Canada. Uh, by the way, my struggle is also decolonial, which means that I recognize that I'm sitting here tonight in Toronto talking to you on the unceded territory of the Anishinaabe, um, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. There is no Black liberation struggle on stolen land unless I am in solidarity with people who've been here for millennia, who have made it possible for all of us to be here, who have made treaties with people who tried to settle here, and those treaties have been violated and continue to this day to be violated. So my struggle is also an anti-colonial struggle. Um, it takes risks in order to advance these struggles because you can read about it and that's great. And we can have this conversation tonight and that's really great. But people are being taken advantage of, harmed, jailed, their labor exploited. People are out in our streets all across this country. And educating ourselves and having these conversations is not going to be enough to make that stop. The thing that is going to make it more likely that those things stop is that we are willing enough to take risks in service of other people, even if they are not our family even if they are not our close circle of friends or our colleagues or the people that we work with. Um, we have to have a broader, I guess, scope of who, right? Um, who we're fighting with and who we're fighting for in order for that to be possible. Um, we live in an era of allyship. That's why I bring all this up because uh, I don't really care for the term ally actually. I know what it means. Uh, so for example, um, in the context of racial discrimination in this country, uh, I said I'm waging a Black liberation struggle. Um, so then I suppose if people are not Black, they think, well, I can't wage in a Black liberation struggle because I'm not Black, or maybe you don't want to. Uh, Desmond, that's your thing. But you know what? I'll be your ally. I'll I'll um I'll tag along sometimes or I'll look in on you sometimes and cheer you on before getting back to whatever it is that I'm doing. Um I don't want allyship. Right? I want people who are willing to make sacrifices for black liberation because I think that that's what changes things. So um allyship is I feel like a notion that centers back on the person who sees themselves as like separate from somebody else's struggle. But um, we are all in this struggle together. And I feel like we have to go beyond these notions of allyship. And we have to start thinking more about um, needing family, like the people you would be willing to take risks for and how the notion of family kind of needs to be extended. 
comradeship. Um, I see a comrade as being somebody very different from an ally. I I love when people talk about we want to, you know, co-conspirators, right? We we don't want allies, we want co-conspirators. We want people who would be willing to take a risk for us. We want people who would be willing to fight back against an unfair system against us. And even, yes, conspire. Because, you know, when the unfair system is holding people down, people actually have to conspire against it in order to get free. And you have to be willing to do that. And that's not allyship. That's, that's, that's like you're in it. You're part of it. It affects you in the same way that it is going to affect somebody else. You might not be affected in the exact same way you're not but being a part of the struggle is a lot different from being an ally to the struggle and that's something i wanted to introduce this evening as 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 we talk um we live in an era of individualism and i feel like this individualism particularly in a country like canada where we have relatively speaking so much um Individualism, I think, often really clouds our politics and really actually clouds our faith. I should tell all you guys that I grew up in a Christian household with Anglican parents, and I went through my entire, uh, you know, elementary and secondary education in the Catholic school system in Durham region in Ontario, just east of Toronto, the greater Toronto area. I know a little bit about the Bible and about my faith. Um, I am a, I am not, I am not really a practicing Christian right now. I, I, I couldn't claim that. However, um, I really don't know what it means to be Christian in this country with the mantra of individualism that is so pervasive in every part of our lives. Um, because I think that you know, faith is a collective practice. And I think that there's very little room for collective practice in our individualistic society. And I think that that affects all of us, even those of us who say that we're Christian, and even those of us who are trying really hard to practice our faith. Um, individualism, by the way, really discourages you from taking risks for other people. Because individualism says, what's in it for me? Individualism says, that person isn't worth taking a risk for because I've got my own stuff that I have to worry about. And we see how these kinds of individualistic ideas can really easily override your presumed faith practices, your presumed religious beliefs, your presumed politically dearly held beliefs. When you've got to stop and be like, yeah, I could do that, but then I'm going to get hurt. It's going to take my time. I could get nervous or exposed that somebody's going to see what I'm doing or what I'm saying. Somebody might challenge me if I do or say this thing. So I'm going to actually look after myself. And you know what? That's actually the best policy because if you don't look after yourself, how can you do anything for anybody else? And suddenly, even though we are supposed to have faith and we're supposed to have politics, individualism has told us that the, actually the, the, the most beneficial thing to do is to be selfish. Um, and, I, and I see that everywhere, and I'm sure all of you do too. So um, I, I believe that uh, our faith calls us to do things, and our politics call us to do things. And then we've got to get over the fact that we're afraid, that we live in a world that tells us that if you are going to do something, you've got to be a superhero, that you've got to do it all on your own, that you're only one person and that one person can't ever actually really make a difference. We've got to get past all of those things. Um, the Skin We're In, A Year of Black Resistance and Power is a book, I think, about a lot of different things. But I think one of the big things it's about is about taking risks. And for those of you who have read the book, um, what's the book really about? If you had to tell somebody, well, what's this book about? I, I would say, as the author of the book, that I think in large part it's about risk-taking, right? It, it's, it's journalism about real things happening to Black people in our country, the conditions of anti-Blackness and white supremacy and racism 
that are part of this country's founding and part of this land being, you know, overtaken by colonial powers. It's about the context of all that and then saying like people are taking risks to fight back against that. Black people, there's an entire chapter on indigenous resistance in this book as well. People are taking risks. People are seeing that the Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls Commission is not doing its work. And they're going out and doing press conferences and saying, this is what happened to my family member. This is what happened to my aunt, my sister. This is what happened to my daughter. And we just wanted a commission where we could talk about these things and the government is making our lives really difficult, is denying us ceremony, is denying us protocol, is not listening to us, is not making the police part of the conversation about missing and murdered women and girls and two-spirit people. But you know, having to go out into the public and say those things while the commission's happening, while there's a whole bunch of Canadians who didn't want it to happen in the first place, while there's a whole bunch of Canadians saying, why are you complaining? You got your commission, you got what you wanted. It's hard to go out and do that. But I document people in this book who did that because the commission wasn't doing what it promised. I document a, a black artist who had his art gallery raided by the police on New Year's Day and made the decision to talk publicly about what was happening to him and try to fight back. And all the people who came to support him, that young man's name is John Samuels. I talked about women in the education system whose children are facing discrimination who decided to stand against that discrimination and who were vilified in the media. You know, um, some of you might remember if you didn't read it in the book, a story from about six years ago when uh, in 2016, a girl in Mississauga was handcuffed by the police inside of her school. She was black and six years old. And I write about that story in this book. I write about the people who criticized her mom as if it was her black mother's fault that the police came into this child's school and shackled her by her wrists and ankles, because that is what happened. A lot of people decided to blame everyone except the police. So when this happens to you, it's a risk to speak out. But this mother did do that to protect her daughter and to stop it from happening to other people. And we are called every day to sit back and watch these things happening in our country or to decide that we're going to take the risk of speaking out as well, of getting involved, of going and standing with people who are experiencing these things, of lifting our voices with them, of writing the letter and the petition, of challenging the local politician. It doesn't stop with reading a book. That might be where it starts, but that's not the work. What sacrifices are we all willing to make in order to fight a real liberation struggle, an anti-colonial, anti-racist, anti-capitalist struggle? And if we're not ready to do those things, that's okay too, I guess. Uh, time is a wasting, of course. We're all here for a, a, a good time, not a long time. Um, but we can't sit in a space of, oh, I'm learning and I'm reflecting forever. People's lives are being altered every day by the unfair systems in this country, by the prison system and the jails, um, which are disproportionately full of Black and Indigenous people. People are being harmed every day, as I write about in this book, by the child welfare systems in this country. because. You know, during the time of residential so-called schools, I hate that we have to call them schools because I feel like that's the wrong word, but um, there were a lot of indigenous children taken from their families, as we know, and put in residential schools where their languages and culture and traditions were taken from them. But there are more indigenous children in the child welfare system today than there were at the height of the residential school system. And black children for decades have also been being swept up into the child welfare system, taken away from our family members, as I write about in this book. 
um, these are the forces that we're fighting against. And it really requires us to be courageous. It really requires us to go beyond being in a place of learning or even knowing that something is wrong. Because that's another place where we might want to settle down is, and you know, I, I know that that thing is wrong. And so I can comfort myself, right, that I'm not one of the bad people. But what are we doing about it? Um, there is there is a Bible quote, actually. Um, I feel like, because we all know that there are many different translations of, of the text. And I feel like our teachers, when we were in school, like, definitely picked a more like watered down version of uh luke 14 26 um there's a whole bunch of translations that i have here if any man come to me and hate this is this is jesus speaking uh of course it's the gospels and he's saying to his disciples if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters yea his own life also he cannot be my disciple. Um, another translation. You cannot be my disciple unless you love me more than you love your father and mother, your wife and children, your brothers and sisters. You cannot follow me unless you love me more than you love your own life. Um, that's pretty radical stuff. That's pretty radical stuff. But I believe it. And I see how important that level of devotion and sacrifice is to a true liberatory struggle, if that's what we want to engage in. And, and when, you know, maybe they didn't want us to hear the word hate coming out of the Lord's mouth when we were children. And maybe that's why we got a softer translation of that particular verse when we talked about it in school. But um, we understand what's being said here, whatever the translation may be. Uh, your condition in life might put you in opposition to your community. It might put you in opposition to your own family. It might put you in contradiction with the people and, and, and the communities that you belong to. And yet, if you are going to serve a higher purpose, you have to be willing to stand up against all of those things, if necessary. That's not um, hypothetical. It's not uh, circumstantial. That's that's what it means, I think, to engage in a liberation struggle. And the thing that I continue to take from my faith is the idea that um, it is about making sacrifices in order to change the world. So with that, I want to open it up to you. I want us to talk. Um, there are so many things that we can get into this evening. I know people are here from different places. I'm in a big city. Some of you may not be. Um, I'm in a very uh, multi-ethnic, multilingual place. Uh, that's one part of Canada. Toronto, as we are always reminded by everyone else, is just one part of the country. And we can't and don't represent everything else that's happening. Um, but I, I want us to talk about sacrifice this evening. I want us to talk about what we feel like we can be doing, maybe things that we wish we were doing more that we don't see happening around us that are important to us, what kind of ways we can push ourselves further when we feel like we're acquiring knowledge, we're learning more about our country, we're learning more about its history, we're learning more about colonialism, about residential schools, we're learning... Um, we we learn about Viola Davis now, or sorry, I said Viola Davis, Viola Desmond, one businesswoman who refused to leave a, a, a whites only theater. But we don't actually learn a whole lot in Canada about like a broader black liberation struggle, which is why I wrote my book, because we really pretend that it's like revolutionary or not even revolutionary, but just like courageous individuals in the black community who stand up one day and say no. And everybody goes, oh, my God, she's right. You know, and then something changes when really we know that that's not how that's not how things work. Um, but we're learning. So how are we applying what we're learning about? What are the opportunities for us to do that? Wherever we live in the country, whatever um, our own kind of like day to day context is, what are the opportunities for us to engage in some real 
risk taking in in the service of liberation. That's what I want to talk to everybody about. And I have a, a, a one other fun activity uh, that I wanted to do with you all in the chat before we go to kind of some more commentary questions, that kind of thing. I'm going to be scrolling back through um, what people have said that I've been missing here, although I see people have been extremely Canadian and polite and mostly listening while I've been talking just now, which I appreciate. Um, but I actually want to do one more, one more interesting thing, I hope, with you here. And that is, uh, I write a lot about policing. And I get questions sometimes from people being like, why, why are you so interested in policing? Like, why do you, why do you talk so much about the police and about policing in general? I would like to answer that question a little bit. But before I do, I would like to just suggest that I'm maybe not the only person who's like intently focused on and thinking about policing kind of like all of the time. Let me tell you what I mean. In the chat, I would like you right now to post the name of any and every television show or movie that you can think of that centers around the police or police adjacent agencies. So I will take, you know, investigative agencies that serve the government, if not police. I will take border officials, because that's a kind of policing as well. Heck transit system cops whatever you want but i want you to think about any and, and any and all movies tv shows and and, and 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 let's see how we do here ready here we go ncis brooklyn 99 -Nine, law and order nypd copland the rookie the coroner i haven't even repeated anything yet pretty hard cases csi FBI, Cagney and Lacey, uh, 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 Hudson and Rex, Chicago Fire, Castle, 48 Hours, <laughs> Paul Blart Mall Cop, a classic that we all know and love, um, Happy Valley, Midsummer Murders, oh my goodness, Barney Miller, um, Chicago PD, Blacklist, um good cop uh good cop bon cop or is it bon cop bad cop i remember that actually that's the 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 la film bilang the the bilingual uh uh, uh movie about two cops i think one uh um uh, an anglophone and one a francophone um we've got 911 rescue 911 was a show that i was watching when i was growing up prime suspect murdoch mysteries blue murder uh nobody said paw patrol yet um uh, that's one i think of all the time uh beverly hills cop nobody has mentioned the bad boys movies with will smith and um 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 uh, martin lawrence yet uh swat bergerac police academy one two three four five um we could do this probably all night new york undercover was a show growing up when i uh used to watch um Oh man, every like half of the movies that you think about. So like Will Smith was a cop in Bad Boys, right? But then Will Smith was also a cop in Independence Day. Independence Day actually starts off around like this kind of like cop who's in, uh, I think, New York one day. Um, no, that was Men in Black. See, he's a cop in all of them. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger has been a cop in like half the movies that he's been in or or somebody in the military, right? Very closely associated. Um, so yeah, you know, I, I write about real life policing, guys. I write about police officers who surveil our children, which is not a TV show. I write about police officers in our schools who watch and follow certain kids, who give kids a hard time in the hallways, who make kids afraid to come to school. I write about that and it's not a TV show and it's not a movie. And people say, Desmond, you're obsessed with the police. Look what you guys just did in like two minutes. Look what you just did. You're still going, Lethal Weapon, Kindergarten Cop, Charlie's Angels, Die Hard. Our culture is saturated with this idea that policing is like central to who we are. That's why I write about it, because I agree. 21 Jump Street, great call. Um, 
I agree with you that policing is front of mind in the society for some strange reason. And I think that the reason that policing is always center and front of mind for us is that um, different forms of policing, I like to say capital P and small p policing. So capital P is like the cops with the uniform and the gun and all that. But then there are forms of small p policing like our child welfare agencies that steal our children, like the um, systems at our schools that suspend and expel children and basically hand them right into the criminal justice system out of school. You know, Robin Maynard has spoken about the um, child welfare to prison pipeline in Canada to go along with the school to prison pipeline that we've all heard of already. Everybody should read Robin Maynard, by the way, Policing Black Lives, and her latest is called Rehearsals for Living with Leanne Simpson. I highly recommend both of these books. Robin is amazing. Um, but I'm writing about these things that are happening for real in our country. They're not a myth. They're not a drama. They're really going on. The capital P police and the small p policing of our everyday lives. So to the extent that I am obsessed with the police, guys, I think I'm in good company. And uh, all of our politicians are obsessed with the police because I live in a city where policing is the number one budget item every year in the city of Toronto. We have municipalities actually all across Canada now that are spending, you know, 15 to 25 percent of their municipal budgets on policing. And there isn't enough money for children's services, roads, water, breakfast programs. There isn't enough money for public transit. But in this era where all of us are reading and learning and doing equity, diversity, and inclusion initiatives, police budgets just keep going up and resources for actual people are being taken away and put into this. There is a show that nobody mentioned when I asked you all to list policing shows and I might have missed it so forgive me if I did but I was curious if one particular show uh was going to come up and if any of you have heard of it before there was a show a few years ago um and the show was called border security the full name of the show was border security canada's front line i wonder if anybody here is familiar with that show, or if you even knew that such a show existed. This was a television series that started in 2022, and it featured the Canada Border Services Agency, CBSA. CBSA had their own television show where they would show themselves engaging with people, stopping them, interrogating them, searching them, and in many cases, the people who were being filmed had no understanding of what was going on and were not consenting to being part of this television reality TV show. Uh, it was finally in 2016 that a group of dozens of organizations led by No One Is Illegal, Vancouver, and um, the BC Civil Liberties Association, they waged a huge campaign over years and they were finally able to get this show border security canada's frontline canceled off of the air and they made a specific case through one man who was a, a migrant who had been put on the show without his permission and you can imagine what it's like imagine that you live in bc somewhere and all the people in your community see you on this show and it doesn't explain why you're being stopped. There's an assumption that you must be doing something wrong because you're on TV being talked to by border agents. Can I give you guys a little flavor of some of the episodes of this show? Because Wikipedia very helpfully, I looked it up and Wikipedia has listed. Um, I want to give you an idea of some of the segments on this border show in Canada about what our border patrol agents do. Um, Detector dog Whiskey identifies three suspicious suitcases from China. 
Uh, a Chinese businessman is belligerent about being examined. It's really important, for example, that they list like who they're talking to and what country they're from in this show, which I find interesting. Um, a Korean man claims to be going to Winnipeg for sightseeing. Like that's literally the description of an episode. Like, and people's faces are put on camera for this. Their identities are exposed. Even if ultimately the border agent doesn't think they've done anything wrong too late and not that it really matters because maybe people should have the right not to have these kinds of engagements filmed but the producers of this show actually fought really hard for years to keep it on the air and cbsa itself argued that this is actually one of the most educational shows for canadians about what we as the border agency does we want this show on the air because we want canadians to see what we do now they don't want to see what they won't don't want us to see what uh they do from say my perspective if i were to come around and follow cbsa with a camera i think i'd be arrested but they'll have producers come in and work with them to portray the angle of their job that they would like and to humiliate people in the process and to teach canadians that if you come to this country you will be under our control and surveillance and there's nothing you can do about it we can even put you on tv against your own will and um, you'll have to deal with that. So it's not just an American thing. It's not just a Black activist thing. The calls to defund and abolish the police are because of examples like this TV show that I gave you, where our border agents somehow have time to be harassing people on camera. But it's not just the most sensational aspects of it. It's literally like taking a walk in my neighborhood and seeing that, you know, if there is a fight in the street, that there can be seven cruisers responding to that. And that that's where our resources are going. But we just learned today that Toronto has an $850 million budget shortfall for the coming year. It's scary to stand up to the police. It's scary to write about policing. It's scary to advocate against policing. It's risk-taking behavior. I write a lot about that particular kind of risk-taking behavior in my book and elsewhere, and I advocate around it. But it's the only game in town, as far as I'm concerned. It's the only real option for those of us who want to engage meaningfully in a liberation struggle. And that doesn't mean we all have to do the same thing. It really especially does not mean that we all have to do what we consider to be the most dangerous thing. Like, I don't know, going out into the street during a demonstration with a placard or um, chaining ourselves to a police station. Um, but what are you willing to sacrifice? Right, that's the question that I want really to, to center on this evening. So um, I've spoken a lot, more than I wanted to. And, um, and I wanna hear from you. So I'd like to take some questions if you're interested. I would like to hear some commentary, um, uh, get some feedback about the things that you're hearing and how it might relate to your faith community and to the work that all of you are doing. The, these 40 days of engagement, I know, are, are, are part of a bigger, a bigger thing for the church, right? So we can talk about those things. We can talk about things that you'd like to see happening, particular struggles that are important to you right now. Um, what is anti-racism in Canada? Why is it important specifically to fight specifically for Black liberation, to fight for Indigenous uh, solidarity and land back. Uh, these are the these are all kind of things I'm interested in talking about. If people have read my book, read other work that I've done, seen other work that I've done, and are interested in asking or talking about any of that, I'm happy to do so. Um, how about I get some water and take 30 seconds because i've been talking for a long time how's that Is that okay everybody good i'm seeing 
Okay, seeing thumbs up. We'll be right back. Some people are there saying uh, are saying that they watched the border security show, and other people are saying they never knew it existed. Uh, somebody said that they watched a little bit of it and couldn't watch it anymore. And uh, I don't blame you. But I think like that's the really interesting thing is that um, a lot of us really don't like the idea of something like that. It sounds really cruel, right? Um, but it's like, what are we willing to do? People in that instance actually identified people who were being exposed through the show. Like they had to find the people who were being against their will put on this TV show. They had to build relationships if they didn't previously have them with those people and say, like, we'd like to fight back against this and we want to work with you to do that. And that takes time and that takes the ability to build those relationships, right? I mean, the sensational stuff, the pageantry, the big parades and demonstrations and shutdowns and things like that, those are the things that make the news. But like organizing to stop a racist and discriminatory tv show um from being on the air involves a lot of like behind the scenes work that nobody ever sees right and i actually wanted to read you guys also a quote from uh harsha walia who was part of no one is illegal vancouver at the time and um and uh was like a uh one of the lead organizations in getting this show canceled um so yeah known as a legal spokesperson harsha walia stated this is back in 2016 since this show appears to be filming people without their free and informed consent it is now time for all of us to proactively protect our individual privacy rights and to collectively assert that we will not participate in this media production subsidized by the federal government that exploits stories of personal humiliation at the hands of law enforcement. They actually tried to bring this show back a couple of years after the successful cancellation of it. So the work often doesn't stop with what we hear in the news and the kind of seeming uh, victory that we get. People have to stick to the fight, right? And continue on um, um, engaging even after they think that they've scored a little bit of a victory. And I, and I see that a lot. And I talk about that again, a lot in my book is that how like what you might seem to think of as a victory is often like just maybe forestalling something really bad from happening or winning a small piece of something that you wanted. Um, but again, if this is, if this is what our, mission is right if this is part of something bigger for all of us then we know we just have to keep going right we know we have to take breaks we know we can't do everything ourselves but we also don't get to check in and out of liberation struggle class struggle decolonial struggle like it's always there right so it doesn't take a holiday um I want to read a, an account from somebody who says, my son gets randomly selected every time he goes through Pearson Airport. I used to think he was exaggerating until I accompanied him a few times. And it was true. Never failed. He was always the one called out for special attention, not me, even though I was with him. Thank you for sharing that, Gary. Um, I can say that Almost every time I'm at Pearson, I get randomly selected too. I've tweeted about it uh, to try and embarrass them a little bit when they do this to me. I, I I was like, guys, like that's like four in a row now. Like, is it like, um, you know, like the SO points card when you go to fill up your gas? Like if I get 10 of these stops, like, are you guys going to give me a prize or something? Like what happens after like you stop me the 30th time? Like, what is this? You know, it, it's an experience that is... Um, so common to a lot of us and i think um when i think of the bigger picture of that i think of some of like the the work that's being done in canada um affecting muslim people particularly muslim and arab people 
um, who are on no fly lists in Canada. How many of you know that there are lists that our government keeps that says this and this and this and this and this and this and this person is not allowed to fly. They are too dangerous to fly on an airline in Canada. Not because they've committed a crime, mind you, because if somebody commits a crime, we can sentence them for that crime. There's a remedy already for that in Canada. We're not saying you committed a crime. We're just saying we're watching you and we're scared. And uh, yeah, Muslim and Arab people, not surprisingly, since September 11th, are the ones being targeted. Um, this is an extreme example, but a friend of mine has a son who at the time was seven years old and was on the no-fly list in Canada. And so every time they would try to go somewhere, he would get flagged and couldn't fly. Now, there was an entire campaign created called No Fly List Kids to um, address this issue. But the problem with No Fly List Kids is that Adults are on the no-fly list as well. So it's a thing that we do a lot is that we appeal to the innocence of children and we say, oh my God, it's so horrible that this seven-year-old boy is on the no-fly list, but that seven-year-old boy is going to be 18 one day. And then is it going to be horrible or are we going to be more understanding that he's being profiled by his government? So we are being profiled at the airport. We are being profiled at the grocery store. I've been profiled by my neighbors at my own front door in the neighborhood that I live in. I've been asked what I'm doing on my own front lawn by neighbors. We are being profiled all the time as Black people and as other racialized people, as Muslim people. People are being profiled. But there are also beyond those individual right acts of discrimination, there's entire systems to watch people. And it's a lot easier when we think about making sacrifices and organizing and work that we're doing. It's really easy to like hear Gary's story about his son getting stopped at the airport and to be like, that's horrible. That shouldn't happen to your son. What's harder is being willing to organize to say, we need less airport security. Sounds a little bit more scary, right? Sounds a little bit more radical. But it's the truth, and it's actually the only direction to actually stop things like this in the future. It's not enough to just get angry that I get stopped or that Gary's son does. We have to change these regimes and challenge power, and this is where it gets scary. But this is, I believe, this is the kind of um, work that we're doing. I would like to take... A comment in French. Um, I haven't been up on my French in many years, so I apologize in advance to Isaac. Um, but I'm going to try. I understand you all have translation. Merci pour cette approche. Et... Thank you for your approach. Uh and for uh, shedding life on these uh, various issues. I can see in Canada, whether it be the First uh, Nations or others, the trend is uh, to refer to our colonial uh, racist past and people want to correct things that were done wrong. But isn't that a, a flight forward, a refusal to do concrete things uh, with respect to current challenges? how to uh, face uh, reality with these real challenges and not just try to correct the past. Wow, good. Isaac, thank you so much for that. For me, first of all, it's important to understand our history because the history of our country is what informs in my view, what we are experiencing today. We talk about our colonial past, for instance, because uh, the police, our institutions like the courts or the government are uh, 
shaped by our history, by our past. We, uh, people uh, obey uh, the laws of our countries uh, because of our history. This is not something that just happens like that. It's not arbitrary. The functioning and the logic of our laws uh, flow from colonialism. And I think if we cut off the past and we just focus on today, what happens is that people think that racism is a product of personal hate, a product of a lack of intelligence or an accident, but not something that is part of a plan uh, extending over hundreds of years. It's important to understand the plan and how we got where we are. So if we try to uh, deal with injustices, uh, the injustices of the residential schools, for instance, it's impossible to do so if you don't know history. If you don't understand that we're doing the same thing today with uh, the child welfare system, we're taking children from their uh, from their parents. In fact, we're doing it more than before. We might say, oh, well, those we don't have schools like that anymore. We don't have to worry about that, right? But actually, we're repeating the same thing with a system that has changed a little, that has a different uh, name, a different title, that's not branded the same way, so that it uh, seems more tolerable for people. And we're repeating the same thing. So for me, it's important to understand, for example, that what's being done to uh, uh, Indigenous people today is not an accident. It's not just a thoughtlessness. It's not just by accident. The concrete plans that are the, the things that we have to do concretely to change things people resist, oppose those things because they don't want to change the country's history. For example, people don't want to change the way history is taught in schools because the past needs to be preserved. So uh, people say, oh, we don't want such and such a lesson to be included today. We don't want to take down monuments to colonial figures that we have in Canada because uh, people are, want to cling to things of the past. So for me, there is a connection between the things that we're uh, asking for today and the past. Uh, I'm not saying anything new there, but we're asking now for reductions in police budgets. This has been a demand for decades on the part of Black people in Canada. So it's important to dignify the contribution that people have made, people who have been fighting for these things back in the 90s and the 80s and the 70s and the 60s. It's important to, to show that our demands have not changed because our conditions have not changed. 
And that's the connection between the past and today, in my view. That's a lot of French for one moment, but in summary, if my translation, or if my, sorry, if my language wasn't good, I'm sure the translation is excellent. Um, the question was about the connection to our past and how do we avoid just not talking and obsessing about past wrongs and really focus on what needs to happen today? And my short answer is, um, you know, people have been fighting for the things we're fighting for right now for decades and some cases for centuries. And those things haven't changed. We need to honor the contributions of the people who have been fighting honor that we don't have to come up with everything new ourselves, that actually the answers were being demanded decades ago and centuries ago, and that power holds on, not because it doesn't know what we want, but because it doesn't want to give it up. So we got to know what's going on in the past, not, you know, the old platitudes so you don't repeat it in the future. I'm not, it's not about that for me. It's more, it's actually saying like, we don't need to search for answers. They're literally right here. We don't even need to ask. Like, guys, how many reports are sitting on a shelf right now about police brutality? Do we need to sit down and have a forum about what to do about the police? Or do we need to look at the last 30, 40 years of reports on why police kill people with mental health issues? Why police um, um, target the homeless? Like the work's been done for us. So when I answer Isaac's question about not obsessing on past wrongs, but just like, let's just get to what we need to do today. Those things can never be disconnected for me. And we have to honor that people have had these answers for a long time. And that power, as uh, Kwame Ture said, power concedes nothing without a demand. Uh, I see uh, Kofi has a hand up. And I think if we are able to do this, that I can like call on you and I don't know, maybe even unmute you, Kofi. Um, let's just see what happens because um, okay, go ahead. Okay, merci. Ouais. Uh, je voudrais merci I would, pour le, le, would le... like you to thank you for your presentation. I uh, haven't read the book, but the little that I have uh, read about it um, enables me to say a few things. Uh, but I would like to talk about uh, a question that came up in the chat. And it has to do with uh, listening to uh, black religious leaders. Uh, and uh, the uh, contradiction of them uh, serving in uh, colonialist white churches. And I think the question is relevant because uh, African Blacks are uh, culturally uh, uprooted. And uh, uh, African Christians are sitting on two chairs, the African and the Christian colonial chair. And the system uh, was, in a sense, uh, formatted in a Western, a purely Western theology. And even in uh, the African communities, the issue is, cur is topical because people uh, have to sing like whites uh, and it's only when the negro african movement uh, of under Aimé César, for instance uh, of and various other proponents that's when africans began to make some distinctions and to start to think about theology on their own terms now in the Canadian context, in a Canadian uh, church, a white Canadian church with uh, where there are whites and blacks, how can a, a leader uh, satisfy the blacks uh, who have their culture and the whites who have their culture? I'm not talking about racism here. 
about uh, an inheritance, a heritage that we uh, that goes back very far in time. And it's a problem to the extent that culturally it's difficult to express yourself in the culture of the other. And that's a problem today that we need to think about together to see if we really need to uh, create ethnic based churches or churches that are white or churches that are mixed with uh, their uh, with specific liturgies so i'm raising the question here and uh, i i think there's a, a lot yet to be done uh, to make sure that each individual is comfortable uh, this is just an observation. Uh, Kofi, thank you very much for your comment. I'll continue in English because I, I want to express myself uh, in a way that's comfortable for me, but I just want that um, there really are challenges. Alors, effectivement, je vais faire une observation. Il, il y a des challenges que nous avons en tant que membres d'une communauté, dépendant de où nous sommes, de où nous avons été élevés. Et je pense que cette question que Kofi a posée sur ce que nous faisons, c'est-à-dire, nous organisons dans des groupes qui sont plus familiar for us? Do we try to get along together and integrate? Um, for me, this is always like where the principle of solidarity is so important because it means that we don't necessarily all come from the same place. We are not all dealing with the same struggle, but that we are um, trying to um, align ourselves with a set of principles and values that are greater than our particular cultural, linguistic, ethnic, racial, other heritage, that we're giving ourselves up collectively to something that we feel unites all of our differences. Um, and so I will use the example of um, the Black Lives Matter movement. I don't mean the Black Lives Matter organization when I say the Black Lives Matter movement. There are different things going on here when we say Black Lives Matter. One of the things going on is that a few people have created organizations under the banner of Black Lives Matter. I have written about Black Lives Matter Toronto in my book. And I'm very sad to say that those organizations in large part have abandoned any real anti-colonial, anti-capitalist, anti-racist struggle and are now engaging in narcissism and self-interest. But the larger movement was like and is something I feel like that was really broad that a lot of people, despite not necessarily being Black, not even being from North America, could be involved in. But I saw a lack of solidarity. I saw people and still see people sitting on the sidelines and saying, well, you're not doing it the way that I think you should, so I can't support you. Or I don't like what this one person said. But it is never about what one person or one organization is saying. It's like, it's about the principles. So when George Floyd, Trayvon Martin, Eric Garner, when all these men were murdered, in the United States when Tamir Rice was killed, um, people weren't rallying just for them. They were talking about the larger issues of police brutality, and they were inviting people who maybe don't experience those things in their daily life to be on board. And um, I believe that um, 
it is hard to penetrate culture and language and racial difference, but it is a huge part of the work. And I, I, I appreciate Kofi's commentary because it's more a commentary than a question that I also reflect on a lot and want us to reflect on. How do we engage in solidarity with people when we might not share their experience? Um, how do we demonstrate that we care, even if we don't fully understand, you know? Um, how do we welcome people in when we see that they actually are not being welcomed into the diverse so-called multicultural, so-called Canadian experience that we are collectively having here? Because that's an issue as well. Um, so many things to talk about. Um, man, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna scroll through, um, Nancy says, I live in a rural area that's starting to see increasing diversity as folks move here from the greater Toronto area. While lots of people recognize that as benefiting that, meaning the increasing diversity, as benefiting everyone, and yes, requiring adjustments for everyone, there's a lot of coded or overt racism being expressed. Are others experiencing this in your communities? And if so, how are you confronting it? Thank you, Nancy. Um, I would like to hear what other people think about this. I was actually born in Red Deer, Alberta, even though I live in Toronto these days. My parents immigrated to Red Deer from Freetown, Sierra Leone in the late 70s. So the first few years of my life were spent in Red Deer. And uh, I was talking with a friend of mine, actually, who was there within the last couple of years during the pandemic. And um, it's still a relatively small place, you know, as far as like cities go. Um, but we are having entire political movements right now in Canada, aren't we? About um, the notion of outsiders. Um, our cities have really big housing problems and a lot of those housing problems are being blamed on outsiders with money who are coming and buying up all the properties. Now, I'm sure that happens sometimes, but I, I really don't think that that's the issue. But somebody's making that the issue. Um, we are living in a country right now where a political party, uh, the People's Party, ran on an unabashedly anti-immigrant platform uh, in their last election with Maxime Bernier. And um, now that movement has kind of coalesced with this larger convoy thing that's happening. And there are a lot of really, really, I think, overt and obvious uh, anti-immigrant, anti-Black sentiments to go along with the anti-Indigenous sentiments in Canada against uh, peoples whose ancestors have been here for millennia. Um, I experienced this growing up in Oshawa, Ontario, which is like kind of, well, it used to be the eastern edge of where you would realistically drive into Toronto if you were coming to work in Toronto from afar. Now people drive from as far as Coburg. You know, the GTA has become this huge, expansive thing. But uh, in the town where I grew up, we're one of the only Black families who attended the school that my sister and I went to. And um, we were hearing in the 90s about how immigrants were coming here to steal our jobs. And it's 2022 now, and people still say that. Um, it just doesn't seem to get old. And th this is, again, why I was saying earlier that uh, I don't think people are necessarily caught up in like the past, as it were. Um, in a bad way. Like if we're saying in 2022 that there's too much anti-immigrant sentiment, 
We have to remember that people were saying that 30 and 40 and 50 years ago in this country. We have to remember, as I talk about in my book, that in the 50s, when Black domestic workers, Black women started arriving here in huge numbers in the 50s, they were not allowed to become nurses. They were not allowed to get married. They were not allowed to get pregnant. And if they did, um, do any of the things that they were not allowed to do under their very limited terms of being in Canada, uh, they were sent back home. So how do we fight right now for status for all, which is a big struggle that many are engaging in? There's huge rallies across Canada at the end of September. I don't know if any of you saw those in your local areas or have been seeing the demands of people that um, all people here get some kind of regular status in Canada, farm workers, um, nannies, hotel workers, right? Um, so many of the people who do things like can our food in places like Brooks, Alberta, right? Not a city downtown, like big city area of Canada, but Brooks, Alberta is full of immigrants, who are coming here to do that Canadian dream thing and who had to work in the most dangerous conditions because no one wanted to shut down the, 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 the meat processing factories, for example, um, when COVID hit. So um, I feel like if we're going to fight for that today, we should also acknowledge that there's a long tradition of people demanding labor rights as immigrants, demanding better access to education, and as to like the overt forms of discrimination, those things have been happening and we should honor them even as we continue um, to fight for what we need right now. Um, somebody's recommending the Secret Life of Canada podcast, which is an amazing, amazing resource. And I totally agree with whoever said that. Marcy, thank you for that recommendation. For those of you who want to know a little bit more about the colonial history of this country, that's like a really accessible uh, podcast. I also see that somebody has very helpfully in the chat posted for October 16th, uh, status for all without delay, tell cabinet to ensure status for all. And uh, uh, on the 16th, there's going to be a big, uh, um, and a big action. So you can actually um, click this link that has just been helpfully provided here by, it was Emo about a migrant of rights. So, so people do know what's going on, which is beautiful and wonderful to see. But by the way, it doesn't matter if you live in a big city or if you live in um, a small town. I think that the point that was just being made here is that in a lot of places in Canada that maybe weren't experiencing large um, volumes of immigration before, things are starting to change. And that these issues that we're speaking about this evening, particularly as it relates to an anti-racism, they're relevant everywhere. They're becoming increasingly relevant everywhere. And by the way, you are on stolen Indigenous territory almost certainly, no matter where you are in this country. So thinking that this conversation somehow does not apply to you, I would question strongly that notion because this is not our land. And every day that we are allowed to remain on this land is a day that it's good to wake up and fight for an anti-colonial future that honors the legacy of indigenous peoples and gives them their land back. By the way, when I say land back, uh, like 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 something like eighty seven percent of the land in Canada is crown land. It's it's King Charles's land. He, it's his now. He had to work really hard for it, as you all saw. You know, watching his mom die and then just having these empires handed to him. You know, so yeah, eighty seven percent of the land in this country actually belongs to King Charles. When we talk about land back, we're not talking about kicking you out of your two bedroom. That's not what we mean. We're not talking about getting you out of your bungalow. That's not land back. Land back means that the crown by law controls the majority of unceded territory in these country and it doesn't belong to them. And that indigenous peoples who are still here, whose treaty rights are continually being violated should have the primary say 
about what happens on these lands. Not that you're going to get kicked out of your house. But remember, we kicked them out of their houses. Just, just to be clear. Um, feel like I might have time to do one more. Um, you know what? You know what? I know what I want to end on. I want to bring it back to taking risks and talking about sacrifice again. And I need my phone for this one. Give me two seconds. It was here the whole time, of course. Um, I want to tell you guys, if you don't know, about uh, something that happened in January of this year. Um, in January of this year, uh, a, a man by the name of Moses Ererhi was shot and killed by a York Regional Police officer in the parking lot of a plaza. Um, that was in January. Um, the police had never said that they were looking for Moses, that he had done anything wrong. There was nothing that the family knew about that led up to this incident. He was not wanted by the police as far as anybody knew. Not that that would excuse killing him, of course, but, um, you know, the special investigations unit said that they were going to look into this in January. It is now October and the special investigations unit have not told us why Moses Herrera, he was shot and killed by one of their officers or if that officer or officers will be charged for what they did. I've been trying to uh, raise awareness for fundraising for Moses's family. Um, I'll put the GoFundMe in the chat in a moment, but that's not actually what I really wanted to ask everybody to do, although you're free to do that. If, if anybody who's actually here with us right now could, um, could um, look up Moses Ararhi's GoFundMe, E-R-H-I-R, H I E is the last name and help us by putting it in the chat. I, I, I'm happy to draw everybody's attention to that, but I, I want to do something different here. Okay. This is a black man in your country who was shot and killed by the police. How many of you know who George Floyd is? Know who Tamir Rice is? Know who Trayvon Martin is? Know who Eric Garner is? Rakia Boyd, Sandra Bland. How many of you know these names, but you can't name the Black people who it's happening to in your own country? Why can't you name their names? That's why I wrote this book, because we live in a country where the prime minister of this country has said George Floyd's name more than he said Moses's name. In fact, I cannot remember an instance where Justin Trudeau has said the name of a Black person in this country who's been killed by the police, but he was willing to go and take a knee in 2020 and 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 pose for the cameras for a few seconds as if he was sorry for something and then move on like it didn't matter. The GoFundMe for Moses is in the chat from Kate. Thank you, Kate, very much. A few of you found it. Anne, Brian, thank you guys very much. Uh, I want to give you one piece of information as I leave this evening about Moses' situation. The GoFundMe there has more information about Moses and what the family have been doing to fight back. But uh, they issued a press release a couple of weeks back talking about how the SIU is supposed to report in 120 days. That's four months after somebody is harmed or killed by the police. They're supposed to take no longer than four months to close their investigation and say what's going to happen next. And it's been the better part of a year now for Moses's family. The family 
through council has requested that a report be provided. They have been met with a deafening silence. The family of Moses has been pressing for information, even a general nature from the SIU. Little information has been forthcoming. And the statement goes on to say, if an ordinary citizen had shot and had had uh, had shot and killed someone in these circumstances, someone would be charged. Perhaps the York Regional Police Officer who shot Moses several times will be charged, perhaps not. However, the delay in reporting to the family and the delay in changing in charging is troubling. It raises concerns about favoritism towards the police. This is why the SIU was created. Now, I got to say that this family are being incredibly chari charitable to an organization that has absolutely just thwarted all of Black people's attempts to get justice for the last 30 plus years. It's Black people who fought for the SIU, by the way, in the late 80s. That's a part of history that is, again, worth knowing as we continue to fight against police brutality today. We fought after Black people were being killed by the police in the 80s. We got a special investigations unit. And now that SIU clears almost every officer that it investigates for a serious crime. Moses's family are asking you, please express your disapproval for this delay on social media, in letters to the SIU, to the OHRC, and or to your local MPP. I am going to put the email address in the chat. Um, the lawyer's name is Paul Slansky, and I'm putting Paul's, um, um, uh, whoops, let me just change the setting here. How do I do everyone, everyone, everyone in meeting? That's the email of the lawyer who the family is asking you to send your letters and messages through. Please express your disapproval for this delay on social media in letters to the SIU, to the OHRC, that's the Ontario Human Rights Commission, and or to your local uh, um, MPP, Member of Provincial Parliament. I am gonna send this entire press release to Adele. But before I sign off with everybody today, I wanna just go back to what I started with about taking risks. As I said, marching in the street is not the only way that people are able to get engaged. It's not the only thing that's needed, but a lot of the things that are needed involve risk-taking. Some people feel really uncomfortable with the idea of having to sign their name to a letter that criticizes the police. I just wanna be really open about that tonight. There's a lot of people for whom that is a scary or uncomfortable activity. Will the police know my name? Will the police keep my letter on file? If I ever need the police as a result of having criticized them publicly or privately, will they engage in some kind of reprisal against me or my family? These are real concerns that people have, which I understand, and they are not standing up to a police officer at a demonstration, as many of us have done. It's not sleeping out in the street. It's not um, um, facing up against border security when they're trying to run up on somebody with their cameras. But it's still scary, right? It's still a contravention of the social order that we've all been taught to obey. But can you go out of your comfort zone for a young man who's not coming back, who none of us can talk to ever again, who none of us will ever meet, who is not going to be part of your intimate friends and family circle that we were talking about at the beginning, or who would you take risks for? This young man has been taken from us by the police, and so we can't reach him in this realm anymore. But is it worth taking a risk? so that his family can get some answers. That's what I'm asking you this evening. That's what I'm asking you in all of the anti-racist, decolonial, uh, 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 class-based work that you might engage in in the future as the United Church. Are you willing to go out of your comfort zone, even if you have questions about what it might mean for you in the future, for somebody who you don't know and who's not coming back? 
that's what's needed to make real change. So you can feel free. Here's his name. I can't do all the work for you guys. If you want to know more about Moses, you have a GoFundMe and you have a name and you have now the email address for his lawyers who would be so pleased. I can't tell you. Your letter doesn't have to be a novel. It doesn't even have to be a page long. I can't tell you what it would mean to this family for you to write a letter and send it to Paul Slansky, their lawyer, saying, we heard about Moses. We think that this delay is unacceptable. We stand with this family and demanding answers. That's three sentences I just said. That's all you have to do. If you want to say more, you can. If you have a similar experience that you want to tie into this, you can. If you know somebody in your community who's being denied accountability by the police and you want to say that too, you can. But I'm asking you to do something, even if it takes you out of your comfort zone this evening, because that is how I believe our liberation struggle is going to proceed and ultimately succeed. I'm done. I've been talking for a long time. I want to thank Adele. And I want to thank all of you who stayed till the end. Um, it has been a tremendous honor to speak with you this evening. And um, I hope we will connect again in our liberation struggles at some point down the road. So thank you all very, 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 very much. One day, uh, somebody is going to do a study on how weird it is to sit in a room and talk to yourself for an hour and a half. And I'm going to read that study because I've done a lot of these. But um, insofar as we're able to be here together and for people communicating and um, posting in the chat and sharing, I really appreciate it all. So thank you. Thank you all very much. Merci beaucoup, 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 Desmond. Uh, thank you beaucoup. very, very much, Desmond. We really appreciate what you've uh, provided to us in terms of practical tools to deal with these situations. And thank you uh, one and all for participating this evening. A reminder, our 40 days begins today. We've got a lot of work to do. And uh, there are some resources in French uh, in the chat. And now over to Adele again. Thank you. Great, and I'll add my thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Desmond, for talking with us, for engaging us, for challenging us, for pushing us outside our comfort zones. Um, I'll also post a few things in the chat. One is um, Desmond's book. If you'd like to pick up a copy, um, the English language version, it's there in the chat. It's available as a, as a discount um, from the United Church Bookstore. Um, if you'd like to participate in any of the upcoming 40 days live events, um, they're running on Tuesdays and there's a great lineup. Um, Desmond has started us off with some great challenges. Uh, if you would like to sign up for the newsletter for the 40 days um, to keep up to date with what else is going on, you're more than welcome to. And then just for an overview of the 40 days, um, you can find it on the website. So we offer great thanks to Desmond uh, for uh, all of his time today, for engaging us, challenging us, stretching us, and we are very much thankful. Uh, everyone, I hope you have a good evening, a good night. Um, thank you for being with us, and we wish you all the best.